In this recording, you can see how the lungs change during respiration as the specimen is not plastinated. I remove the lungs with the heart and other associated structures from an unembalmed cadaver. After washing the blood, the specimen was preserved in Jory's solution at 4 degrees Celsius. This maintains the organs in lifelike condition, more real, relatively soft, almost as it would appear during surgery. I will also point out the vagus and phrenic nerves, carotid arteries, superior vena cava, and a few cartilages. The lungs feel soft and spongy. The heart is firm and is surrounded by the pericardium. This hole was caused accidentally during removal of the specimen. This structure here is remains of the thymus and is located anterior to the pericardium. These are some of the strap muscles which are attaching to the hyoid bone here. The hyoid is a U-shaped bone which is not attached to any other bone in the body. It is held in place by numerous muscles which are attached to it. We are looking at the posterior aspect of the specimen. Look at the epiglottis which prevents the food from entering into the larynx. This is the pharynx and here is the esophagus. I'm going to introduce a tube into the trachea through that opening, through the larynx, and inflate the lungs by connecting the other end of this tube to an air outlet. I wonder if you can see inside that opening the two thin, shiny vocal cords on either end. Take a deep breath. Watch the lungs as I let the air in. That is how the lungs inflate when we breathe in. As I stop the air, the lungs deflate just like they would in expiration. Normal expiration is due to the elastic recoil of the lungs. Breathe in and breathe out again. Note how the air is coming out. This is due to the rupture of the visceral pleura. If this happened to me, it would cause pneumothorax. Can you think of some other ways that might result in pneumothorax? As I've pinched one of the main bronchus, you can see that the other lung expands a lot more. And so if one lung was collapsed, the other lung will expand more to fill in the space in the thoracic cavity. As I reflect some of the infrahyoid muscles, you can see the thyroid cartilage. As it is more prominent in men, it is called Adam's apple by some. Inferior to the thyroid is the cricoid cartilage. These cartilages form part of the framework of the larynx. The trachea, as well as the esophagus, both begin at the lower border of the cricoid cartilage. This here is the lobe of the thyroid gland. Here is the isthmus connecting one lobe to the other lobe of the thyroid. Note the cut ends of the right common carotid and subclavian artery. This string-like structure that I'm now holding is the right vagus nerve. One of its branches is the recurrent laryngeal nerve 
and I'm now tracing it as it lies in this groove between the trachea and the esophagus. As it comes up ascends, it is very closely related to the inferior pole of the thyroid gland. These little rounded structures lying alongside are small lymph nodes. You're perhaps wondering what happened to the phrenic nerve. I'll show that to you next. Well, here is the phrenic nerve as it is going between the pleura and the pericardium, anterior to the hilum of the lung. This opening over here is the opening of the superior vena cava. As we zoom in, you can see this tiny opening in the superior vena cava that I'm putting the tip of the forceps in. That is the opening of the azygous vein, the only tributary of the superior vena cava. This other opening through which I've put the forceps is that of the left brachiocephalic vein.